be much pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Marcus Beck, uh, who is the Professor of Digital Education at the Technical University of Delft and the Director of the Leiden Delft Erasmus Center for Education and Learning. Uh, he received his diploma in psychology in 1995 and a dissertation from the University of Fair in 1998 on adaptive information technology. From 2001, Professor Specht, he headed the Department Mobile Knowledge at the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Information Technology. And from 2005 to 2018, he was Professor for Learning Technologies at the Open University Netherlands and the head of the Learning Innovation Lab. Uh, his research focuses on, focuses on mobile and contextualized learning technologies and social and immersive media for learning. Uh, Professor Specht is also an Apple Distinguished Educator and President and was president from 2013 to 2015 of the International Association of Mobile Learning. Uh, I actually, uh, uh, a few years back, I was also uh, lucky to spend some time with Marcus in Shanghai, uh, in Shanghai Open University, uh, and we, uh, he was one of the keynote speakers, one of the uh, profile, uh, international speakers at Shanghai Open University, uh, speaking about ubiquitous learning and his, and his knowledge on uh, technology integration was really, really impressive. Uh, and he created a, a much buzz around Shanghai Open University in terms of uh, his, his knowledge on mobile learning, ubiquitous learning, learning anyway. So thank you very much, Marcus, for joining us today. Uh, and let me say welcome to UNISA, Marcus, once again. It's a pity that uh, you're not physically here, <laughs> but uh, we still can do what we need to do. And maybe in the future, we can physically get all of you back onto the space as well. So thank you, Marcus, very much. And I hand over the platform to you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for the kind introduction, Denzel, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to speak today. I just uh, share my slides and hope you all can see them. Uh, to get a bit of interactivity, let's just kick off with, with a little experiment, see how, how far the network can go. May I ask, uh, you all to shortly switch your camera on so that it's for me I, I get a I get a bit of idea for who is there um, um, let's let's experiment great yeah this looks marvelous yeah my kind of virtual classroom is filling up here uh, great more and more people coming in Perfect. I will probably make a screenshot of that. Yeshe, hey Denzel, great. Ah, we have also very young guests. That's great. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I recently applied for <clears throat> some some funding, and we looked into self-regulation. And I think most of you know that experience of talking to an empty classroom. By the way, thank you all for shortly switching on the camera. So we probably make this more efficient now and, and go back to blind mode. But having this feedback gives you the idea of, of being in a, in a real space, uh, talking to people. Um, that, that is very important for our idea of um, or and getting feedback and regulate our behavior. So uh, you can all see my slides. Probably reduce we reduce the interactivity to the chat. Uh, you can give me a short yes or thumbs up or post things. Okay, let's get started. Um, my name is Markus Specht. Um, I think uh, uh, Denzel highlighted. Uh, very nicely, uh, a bit of my career. So I'm, I'm a bit of interdisciplinary um, guy. So I, I came from cognitive psychology, but worked in software engineering. And uh, the last two and a half years, I had the luck to um, join and head up the Center for Education and Learning for three Dutch universities, uh, the Technical University of Delft, the University of Leiden, and uh, the Rotterdam Erasmus University. And um, there's a, this is a joint center for the three universities. I also work with different disciplines here in this context with engineers, uh, but also with more social science, humanities. So 
different backgrounds and I really enjoy that interdisciplinary approach. Furthermore, I'm uh, since this or since 2020 heading up the there's a, an association for the four technical universities and they also do a lot of research in engineering education. So that that's about the context. You find both centers online uh, if you want to learn more about the activities. Um, but I have some very interesting news for you. Of course, also the, the Netherlands has been hit hard uh, with COVID. So there has been a dramatic response uh, actually in the news last week. That's the newspaper from uh, last week, you see Saturday. Uh, the ministry decided we go full mobile. So mobiles will be the technology, mobile number one, uh, to be used for all teaching and learning on all levels from primary school to higher education. Of course, this is a dramatic step. And uh, today I'm happy to show you about some of the backgrounds and the developments that led to that uh, decision. First of all, why? Why has that happened? And uh, what were the main reasons for that decision? Very simple, everybody, I don't know, uh, in, in the Netherlands, that's definitely the case. I think nearly everybody has a mobile smartphone nowadays. It's affordable. Um, you can get it for little money. All variations are out there from open hardware to uh, very consolidated, long-standing systems. So everybody has access to this technology. Second, mobiles are the number one in, for sure, listening, podcasts, music, everybody uses that. Watching, uh, if you look to the younger generation, especially and secondary class, it's the number one device for watching. YouTube, uh, all kinds of podcasts, all kinds of uh, video, so everything watching mobiles are number one and even more if you look into usage habits on reading so with all important activities for learning listening watching reading mobiles are the number one device that made the decision even easier furthermore um, it was considered and we did uh, the last 15 years long-standing research on this of course, it's the number one device to collect photos and personal memories, as also audio recordings, or collect points of interest, locations where you have been, and um, which are important. Even more on top of that, what is the number one platform in gaming today? Of course, it's mobiles, it's smartphones, it's tablets. This is the number one device for social media, for dating, you name it, uh, it's the number one device. And furthermore, of course, as these mobile devices, smartphones have all kinds of sensors, high resolution cameras and depth sensors, it's also unbelievably the number one device for augmented reality. And uh, this is a, a future leading technology. So this was one consideration that the ministry took into account because of course the technology to be used also has to be future proof. Um, and last but not least, what we all experienced uh, in the pandemic, of course, what were the Number one use cases for all of us, video conferencing, email, and every of these devices, or nearly everyone has a camera built in. You can do video conferencing. There is pre-installed software solutions for that. And let me point that out. We didn't even count in the number one application that is messaging. 
but of course that's integrated. So messaging, there has been recent studies uh, from um, big uh, online sites, especially for students, for learning content, which showed that the number one service that students go to is mobile messaging. So how could the minister choose for something different than mobile devices? I couldn't count any uh, or find any service where mobiles are not number one. So this made the decision easy. But uh, also what make, made the decision easy when the pandemic hit was that the last 15, nearly 20 years, we had different stages of development. So we did experimentation. There is long-standing work, especially using mobiles in excursions, in mobile video conferencing, in collaboration, but also in educational games. So there's a lot of research showing the effectiveness of this approach. And um, also we did in the years after that, a lot of work on collaboration, group work, but also lecturing with mobile devices. So that basically led to the decision that we now have a nationwide rollout. All the devices are available instantly. It's a cheap solution. We have no usability problems and it's simply working. This led to even more consequences. You see here an overview, but um, in the context of preparing this shift, we restructured the whole curriculum in all kind of classes and uh, all kind of subjects to use mobile technologies. And you will not believe it, but here I give you only some examples. The mathematics curriculum on all le levels has been restructured. And we have simple side effects as no one needs to additionally buy a calculator anymore. So we all have a software calculator very cheaply available on the, on the smartphones. We have software for geometry, for algebra exercises dedicated to complete the online lecture for exercising at home. And you won't believe it, the engagement of students in mathematics has risen, has risen significantly as we have a lot of interesting math games that put in competitive elements into this. So we have seen a dramatic rise in interest in mathematics. Furthermore, language. You won't believe it, but the use of audiobooks has first led in the last year to the effect that students get excited again about the, the core literature we, we're reading. And they read it together in social reading apps. And furthermore, we have integrated technologies into our tablet readers that can be simply plugged on to standard tablets, which enable a reading coach. So we can track the reading by eye tracking and give instant feedback to students on their reading speed, coach them on understanding problems, and the educators can get learning analytics of these activities. So mathematics, language, core competences for the future, digital skills, of course, it's embedded in these technologies, programming, data analysis, collaboration, you have built it in. You don't need to do anything there masses of applications for learning programming on smart devices, on mobile devices. And not to forget about that, most of us had problems of like, do we still use our handwriting? More and more kids switch over to keyboards. But with this solution, we basically came back to using pens doing handwriting, doing drawing, which is an extreme advantage for developing also physical skills for younger kids. And not to forget about, and there we built this on recent research from Switzerland, you can easily diagnose um, specific 
problems in writing by analyzing the tracking data from the pens. Furthermore, of course, music, it's built in to uh, the system and photo class. So we got new possibilities by these devices that have not yet been explored all over the place. But this is just to give you an example what the impact of this shift actually was also on the education system. And there's one other big advantage I would like to share with you. So this is a typical school day at the school we introduced uh, the solution. And uh, as one consequence, we also could move to a complete agile lecture plan. That means the students can choose themselves the topics of their own projects and define their own goals and work flexibly with these mobile tools to work on their uh, projects. And we, we structured that into really working more with coaches as teachers, for example. This is an example from secondary school, but we implemented it also in higher education. So uh, this is a typical example of how the application of agile methods in school looks for us. Of course, we take into account knowledge building on all levels from cognitive to motivational behavior and contextual level, but it's also the social context that is brought much more in because all of mo or most of the social context nowadays of our kids and students take place online. So we can use all this input and bring these students together in projects they work on and uh, built from their home. All right, so this has been the developments in the Netherlands. I can just uh, ask you to please join the movement and I will give you some ideas of the flexibility we also have seen in using this approach. So please all join that movement uh, if you want to have some scientific uh, evidence and underpinning of this. This has been a book from 2015, finalizing or also looking into some of the research that is happening there, following uh, the approach uh, from uh, Singapore on the definition of seamless learning. So seamless learning in that sense of like um, bridging different seams or gaps, the seam between formal and informal learning that is solved by mobiles, personalized and social learning. Social uh, mobile devices are the most social tool we, we have available nowadays. Uh, you can use it across time, across location and in different applications contexts. And you can even combine multiple devices. And considering the development of augmented reality, you can bridge physical and digital worlds. Just to give you one example of that, uh, that we worked on, uh, I think about 10 years ago as a research prototype, but we used a lot of mobile technologies in um, training architecture students. And the case was that these students simply have to take snapshots of buildings wandering around in the city and connecting this. Uh, no, unfortunately, there is no open version of the book coming to the question, but you can of, find, of course find in the uh, uh, libraries, uh, you find most of related or similar articles of the authors if you have the, uh, the uh, table of contents, which is available online. And um, so the architecture students had to take as a task, they had to do analysis of existing buildings and they had to take photos, they had to take measurements of the buildings, uh, either to describe the facade, to describe the relations, the structural uh, uh, concept and so on. And uh, so this bridging of physical and digital, digital worlds, uh, therefore also mobiles are the number one tool uh, to do that. 
Okay, let me let me show you some of the flexibility of this approach. Of course, you can come from different pedagogies. I mean, our ex our experience was that teachers come from different backgrounds. They use different approaches for teaching. So an approach we've chosen must be flexible. So one uh, flexibility is pedagogy. This is a publication already from 2004 we built on. So dependent if you do programmed instruction and follow a kind of behaviorist approach and want to drill exercises and, and uh, uh, use that, or if you come from a, a complete constructivistic approach or you want to focus more on situated or collaborative learning, uh, for all you find examples in the literature and also in our approach, how to implement this with mobiles. I give you some examples. For one thing we found a lot in um, mathematics, for example, that build back to go back to paradigms as programmed instruction. You can very easily, and there's a lot of systems out there on adaptive feedback in math exercises, where you very easily can use uh, generative uh, systems, so systems that by random create new exercises, go to algebra, go, go to geometry, uh, go to even complexer fields as linear algebra in higher education. You can use these systems to scale up your um, tasks, your exercises, adapt them to the students and present them uh, and uh, let the students grow with this. Beside that, of course, you can also, as you see on the right side, contextualize these learning activities. So connect them to the physical space available for the students. Another example, which more in depth even, um, explores that approach. What we've seen in the pandemic is that, um, of course, people want to go outside, they go, uh, they go hiking, they go wandering as far as this is possible. So we use the physical activity uh, where they can individually explore the city, have a walk, and by that activity do either mobile blogging, collect content, collect photos, or just listen to podcasts we have produced that guide you through a city. That all is possible. Of course, it's distributed, it's decentralized, so we don't have to need to have a group of people, but everybody is able to do that individually. Uh, a last approach, and there is a lot of research, so well in the book, then on other publications on the use of mobile technologies for uh, excursions or field trips. We applied that in different kind of fields from really primary school up to higher education. Um, you can use the mobile device um, on all parts of the activity from preparing an excursion, defining the tasks, collecting data in the field trip as also video conferencing in the field and out of the field uh, with a mobile device. Uh, it's ideal. You don't have to do anything. You can just use it out of the box. These were some examples for how you can implement different um, learning paradigms or your ideas about this learning paradigm uh, with mobile technologies. Another approach is, of course, your task design can vary. What kind of tasks are you using? This is um, an example from even older, it's from 2002, where we used basically different task structures as collaboration means for students. Uh, they were also located in the city center or in the city or in the area where the excursion takes place. And you can use the tasks as a structure for collaboration. And uh, this was this uh, project about a second one where we supported more individual uh, excursion. This is very similar to the example about architecture I explained before. This is an uh, uh, online uh, or a mobile um, tour for Florence. We developed uh, at the Open University as a prototype, which basically gave you the chance to 
freely explore Florence in Italy, um, but at the same time also look at tasks and get specific tasks for your current location in the city. And to these tasks, record annotations, record photos you take on the mobile device. It brought all together on your mobile um, smartphone. Um, but it's not only individual, but let's say you are more in complex collaboration scenarios. I just show you some examples of how role driven design can be implemented. This was from a project also in an excursion context. You can see on the left side. Um, at that time, we still were using the classroom, but it would be easily possible also to implement all the roles on the left side distributed from home. But you had basically a task manager person which structured tasks. You had person that do desktop research on the lower side. So let's say the task would be a, it's a biology class and we have to find um, the different plants growing in a certain area. So these people on the left side can work from home. They can do desktop research, find out about the, the plants uh, in online archives um, and so on. The task messenger, def uh, the task manager defines these tasks. We have um, colleagues on the left side to to support the collaboration as the teacher, the director of the whole field trip, but also the video conferencing manager and the messaging person that uh, monitors and moderates the chat. And on the right side, we have distributed people uh, in a uh, excursion, which basically uh, either used to approach experts. So one person could take an interview online and that can be live streamed or is live streamed to all the participants either at home or in the field. Or you could ask, um, uh, for example, the data gatherer on the lower right side to collect specific data. So in that project, we worked out a complete role model and used these roles for designing different activities and collaborations between these roles. And these, of course, now can easily, easily be implemented using mobile devices, so well at home as also in the field, and um, setting up these collaboration tasks. Um, this is an example of uh, 10 years later, uh, where we more uh, we're looking into um, uh, inquiry based learning and the use of these roles in inquiry based learning. Um, one example uh, I also implemented now in my uh, lecture with, high, uh, with higher uh, education students or university students. Um, for example, did you have a healthy breakfast this morning? So I asked, that was the, the main question and to become aware of what means, what, what does it mean to have a healthy breakfast? So uh, they all gonna post uh, a photo this Wednesday on their breakfast and we will just reflect in the class on uh, what they did. And on the right lower side, you see a dashboard we developed in, in that context which basically monitors and looks into, did people submit something? Did they collect data? So we looked at the different phases of the inquiry cycle and the different activities of students, which also should help the students to basically reflect on their own activities. So, um, I think this is in Dutch, but you get a little impression of how the tools work in context. This is an excursion in uh, Maastricht, uh, in the very south of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, the weather is typical, I would say. No, not always. In the Italianse stad Florence. In the pilot Cultuurhistorisch Veldwerk met AR Learn. And the scenario uh, here we have uh, so called lifelong learning students, um, people that really want to engage in learning activities um, all late, also later in their professional life. 
And uh, in this case, you have to work, uh, walk through the city. In this case, you have to work, uh, walk through the city. In the historical center of Maastricht. In the historical center uh, of Maastricht, and they use the mobile device basically to find the location and record reflections. They use it as a simple online audio recorder. We have an AR Learn, an instance ontwikkeld om studenten op een intensievere manier. This is the back end basically. Uh, so I think you, you get an idea. This is the way how you start a tour. You just scan a barcode and you're ready to go. Um, by the way, are all still alive? Please give me a little sign in the chat. Any questions? Okay, I come to augmented reality in a minute. Uh, all good at Denson's place. Still there, hooray, very good. We are here. Excellent, Derek, thank you. Is there free data for students? Paul, can you say something about uh, what you mean with, with free data for students? Like free data to do simulations or what? Okay, data on cell phones. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the problem on, on uh, you mean a data connection, the, of course, in, in, a, in a small country, um, it's as the Netherlands, it, it's not that problem anymore. You have wireless hotspots nearly everywhere. So that problem actually also was solved. So we don't need to think about it. And the, the competition on data plans is is extremely high. So basically all the students already had a data flat rate in place. Uh, we needn't, we need, didn't need to take care of that. And, and just to mention that uh, beside that, uh, a very interesting side effect, but that also has shown uh, or has shown up uh, earlier in, in research is that actually the mobile device helps a lot to get things, to get technology out of the way. So for the rare occasions where people really met face to face, of course, due to the pandemic restrictions, technology was gone away completely and they interacted. And um, this helped also a lot to shape a new vision of using technology in education. Uh, okay, Vanessa. Uh, was wondering with the push for social emotional learning in schools, this would also flow over to higher education and how would this be managed virtually? Oops. Um, social emotional learning in schools, of course we have, I mean, uh, I don't know if I, if I get your question um, uh, correctly, but what we have seen, especially with the arts and the STEAM uh, approaches in schools like embedding more artistic expression and also this freedom. And we did this so well in uh, primary, secondary and higher education. This led to uh, uh, a lot of more involvement and engagement and motivational um, um, enhancement, if you want to say so, or more motivation to learn and look into the learning materials. Probably you can um, detail your question a bit more. Great. It looks that there are some more um, activities, but let's go on. Look into process uh, driven design. Another flexibility. So you might have different educational processes you want to look into, how you implement that, how your detailed learning design looks. Uh, mobiles give you the flexibility. This is in a case where we used uh, a mobile app basically for implementing training in higher education in uh, the medical centers. And in these medical centers, we have, for example, first responder teams uh, are now working on a training um, using these technologies for uh, intensive care units. So their people have to develop certain skills 
which are critical to patient safety. Uh, in, this in this case, it was a handover scenario, so how to hand over patients. Um, but you also have it now, for example, for intensive care units there, people have to be trained to very early identify critical symptoms of patients, which is uh, essential. And we train these skills with mobile tools. So you had very um, embedded realistic scenarios uh, where you, for example, uh, there happens in an emergency. So you really learned by training following these scenarios and you can easily implement these scenarios just with a mobile game tool uh, we have developed. But in that sense, uh, we were able not only to develop uh, games in for single players or multiplayers, um, but you also had a lot of flexibility for collecting data and embedding learning in authentic situations. This is a language game we developed for um, primary school kids. Basically, um, you get a scenario like a friend comes to visit, uh, you have to prepare pancakes. Luckily, the supermarket was the last thing that was still open where kids could go and they could scan uh, the um, the products in the supermarket and learn the uh, words or the expressions of the names of the products in three languages, as we have a lot of uh, border regions also in the, in the Netherlands, like with German, France, uh, uh, you could learn the, the names of the products in three languages by scanning the, the, the products. And this, of course, le led to several effects. Uh, kids were really motivated to use these tools. Secondly, you got an authentic embedding, a situational embedding uh, of the learning situation. And you had a scenario uh, which you could, of course, easily vary and uh, give other tasks for mobile activities in context. So we also applied this in higher education, the same principle for energy reduction uh, at the workplace and at home. Uh, we also applied it um, in this uh, critical situation where you have a hosted simulation. We did this for the United Nations. And uh, the importance of this approach was that we really could simulate the steps of such a, a critical intervention in time. This is another example of a more collaborative scenario. Uh, so this is a, a schematic uh, setup of uh, the harbor in Rotterdam. And uh, we basically had to train peoples on the different faces from the hinterland transportation to the vessels uh, to become more aware of what is happening in the rest of the harbor, because this of course, costs a lot of money and here you can also save a lot of money. So we basically did a decision training game on mobile devices where we did a kind of simulation where people got simulated phone calls, simulated tasks to learn in that game about actually the importance of the other stakeholders uh, for their own decisions. So this is a bit the logic flow. You have different roles, like from sales to the vessel manager. You introduce the group, you have individual activities, but you also have to take personal decisions. And the main learning objective was just to become aware of the importance of this individual informations and decisions to the other part and to your part. So last but not least, I mentioned at the beginning um, that um, mobile devices are the number one devices for collecting data and doing reflection on that data. So what kind of data can you collect with mobile devices? We implemented and used in the past in projects, video recordings, photos, audio recordings. You can even type in and calculate numeric values. We did that, for example, uh, in projects on biology uh, where you had to measure water pH value or water temperature. You don't need a fancy 
uh, connector, you can just measure with your sensor and type it in into your smart device, but you instantly connect it. You can deploy and use multiple choice questions or all types of uh, assessment um, issues. You can scan barcodes to trigger activities or measure certain activities. So there's a huge variety of possibilities to collect data with these devices. And of course, you can use this in different directions. This is a publication that's uh, freely accessible um, uh, where we analyze different learning scenarios and different, uh, different applications on the influence of learner agency. So we basically can found that you have a lot of varieties from direct instruction to peer-to-peer -peer communication, which all can support and strengthen different phases of a learner agency model, from goal setting, content access, learning activities, strategies, reflection on your activities and monitoring your own progress in a kind of self-regulation cycle. So I think this gives you, uh, if you look at that paper, you find a lot of evidence collected on which and what kind of learning activities could be helpful for your purposes. Uh, a last example, but this is, uh, I think, a very good example on how powerful actually these mobile notifications are. I think all of you have or might have a lot of mobile notifications. You see on the device type, this is already a bit older, but nevertheless, what we simply did is we sent a short message to students after their school day. On the one hand to rate their school day, but also give us an indication of what is the most important thing you learned today. And we, we found immediate effects due to this reflection on the personal engagement and on the motivation of the students for specific topics. So just a single moment of injecting reflection in your overarching learning idea and design can have can have a strong impact. So now uh, on the question of augmented reality, uh, this of course we only uh, started to implement, we don't use it, we use some examples now in higher education, um, but these are scenarios where you can, in this case you need a, a big screen at home, uh, but you can also do it with a smart device. The important component is the sensor technology of having a camera uh, available. And in that case of the presentation trainer, you could train presentations at home, but just standing in front of your device, your camera is scanning your body behavior, your voice, and it gives you instant feedback on if you, for example, cross your arms, uh, like what I'm doing now, and uh, says, oh, probably you should not cross your arms. That gives like cutting out signal or it gives a different signal to your uh, participants and to your listeners. So you probably should use like, your arms in that way or uh, uh, other ways. It said, talk slower, make breaks. All this kind of instant feedback was embedded uh, on a, a system using the sensors of a mobile technology. I skip the video demo for now. We can come back to that uh, if we're interested. And we uh, brought this a bit further with the mobile devices uh, that are currently available that are probably not, or that for sure not uh, are everyday use, but a lot of the augmented reality we could also simply implement with uh, smartphones and tablet devices. In this case, this was a project where we really tried out how far we can go with augmented reality um, and we used it for training in uh, medic medical care, uh, we used it for training in maintenance and I show you a short video on how this can look. Okay, unscrew this bolt here. Yes, like this. And then 
take it out, pull it like this. Wonderful. Okay, now lift the rotor like this and take it off the shaft. Then hold the support and remove the rotor. Exactly. Now flip the rotor and put it back on the shaft. Now take the spirit lever here and put it on top like this horizontally. Then check if the bubble is in the middle here. Perfect. Now take the spirit lever and turn it and put it on like this. Yes. Now check again the bubble in the middle here. If it's perfect. Okay, take the scissors here. Then cut the threads here and here. Yes, yes and here. Now hold the thread control unit like this and then pull the threads out. Go threads. Yes. Okay, so you get the idea. In this case, this was really a remote coaching scenario. So you can imagine that there are, are a lot of uh, possible patterns of how you can use augmented reality. Uh, in the in the video we just have seen, uh, augmented reality was used as a remote communication issue, or or uh, uh, media, uh, meaning that uh, the voice of the coach you heard, the coach was also real time connected uh, via a camera to the person doing the maintenance job, and could just embed virtual hands to give uh, guidance to the learner. Um, and in this paper that is also available open access, you find uh, 18 uh, design patterns of how augmented reality has been used um, from, and uh, just to highlight uh, two of the last examples, of course, augmented path. This is a typical embedding in the visual field where you give indication and guidance for users. And we use these uh, in, in different ways. Um, for example, in the engineering uh, domain where we guide the visual attendance of the learners to certain parts of a virtual uh, reality uh, component of our augmented reality and uh, object. The augmented mirror design patterns you just have seen in the, uh, in the uh, presentation trainer. So basically you stand in front of a display. The display has some sensors. It can record and track your movements. A similar uh, approach we do now with handwriting recognition. I mentioned that at the beginning. So we did a handwriting trainer for younger kids, which basically enables us to track all the movements and the angle of the pen and the pressure of the uh, applied to the pen when writing and analyze these, da these data points and give real time feedback to the students, either to the path they are drawing or to the speed in which they're drawing or also to the pressure, which is a very good indicator for the body tense uh, they are applying and how relaxed they are writing. So you have a lot of possibilities and I would like to highlight that augmented reality in this sense is not only like the full embedded HMD display, but uh, one recent project we just started this year is uh, using holograms in education at uh, Delft University of Technology. And uh, we basically want to use holographic recordings of either objects, but also of lectures uh, to give a real time immersion and embedding. And this could mean that probably the next time uh, I want to give a talk to you, you can 
if you have a kind of mobile device at home, just see me as a hologram uh, in your room. And believe me, this technology is not uh, uh, out there for the next 20 years. This technology is affordable. Uh, you just need a recording studio, which you also need for good video. And you can use a mobile device to play back uh, the holographic uh, information. So this is not uh, something that is uh, very fancy or very advanced, although we hope that we find interesting effects in using holographic information. So to conclude, I, th I hope I convinced you that a uh, decision of the Dutch government was uh, appropriate. Um, and uh, I hope you join in the movement and we all will use mobile devices in the future for our successful learning journeys on all levels. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Marcus. I think that was uh, indeed fascinating. Um, but I think more especially, Marcus, that uh, that uh, what you've said with mobile learning uh, resonates a lot with the South African and the broader African context, if I may say that as well, in terms of access, uh, which is one of our biggest issues, and it's posed a critical challenge uh, in the last uh, round, in the past last year, specifically with the COVID crisis. But Marcus, also thank you for debunking the myth that mobile learning is only situated in developing contexts. <laughs> I think that is quite interesting because, you know, we have this 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 kind of idea that uh, it's the developing context that features where mobile learning features a lot. And to see this in your context is quite fascinating. I mean, that, that actually opens up a whole new space for us to engage on uh, 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 beyond the idea that it's just a developing context that can benefit from mobile learning. But also uh, in terms of, of how mobile learning forces us to rethink curriculum design, uh, mobile learning pedagogies, uh, and and also uh, the way you've you've actually spoke about, I think it has it resonates much with us at Unisa about bridging the distance gap between our students and institution, and I think that is where a lot of our colleagues will find this find what you are saying quite interesting and fascinating. I've also shown, seen that you've uh, integrated a lot of the QR codes, and this has been something that we've been trying to integrate at Unisa as well for some time. Uh, it'll be good to see how we can actually integrate that more strategically uh, in terms of where our institution is. So, colleagues, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, so let's, I'm, while Richard opens up the space for us, colleagues, what we're going to do is a Q&A session with Marcus. I know you've got some interesting questions that you posed. Uh, I'm going to ask Richard to, un, to allow you to unmute your mic. Uh, so what we can do at the moment is just to have a more engaging discussion uh, is just raise your hands, colleagues, and then we can open up the space for you to to post your questions. Uh, I see Richard has now unmuted you, uh, given you the opportunity to unmute yourself. So if you can just raise your hands and then we can, uh, you can offer your questions. Okay, so we have anybody? Probably while you think of questions, uh, just as a um, disclosure also, of course, uh, um, I'm not an official representative of any kind of uh, Dutch government organization or their like. I'm a researcher fascinated about that field, so you have to contextualize my uh, uh, newspaper uh, fakes in that context. But I think that was clear to most of you. But um, yeah, and, and one remark about what Denzel said, of course, the interesting effect um, that happened. I remember a lot of discussion on mobile learning being about the distance you have to travel and, and the accessibility. But uh, here we also have seen that the pandemic reshaped thinking of, of people about the importance and accessibility of these platforms. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. Uh, I see we've got Vanessa. Vanessa, you've got a question? Yes, thank you very, very much for your presentation. I must tell you, um, I feel, almost feel like a kid in a candy shop uh, when I when when I see uh, what the possibilities really are if you're willing to think out of the box. Um, so, uh, uh, Denzel, if you will permit me, I've got two questions, and Marcus, if that's okay, I'm not sure how many other people have questions, but I'll I'll try and make it quick. 
Um, I just wanted to contextualize um, my my uh, question on social emotional learning. Um, so um, I work a lot with schools, and we and we working. Uh, I work within social emotional frameworks in order to assist with some behavioural issues that are uh, taking place at school and uh, various activities that we can do uh, to assist with emotional regulation, interpersonal skills and the like. So when I was busy uh, uh, watching your presentation, I just thought it would be so awesome if higher education uh, I'm not sure to what extent other universities do this, but every university has got a student center. And I was just wondering to what extent we couldn't develop something virtually to help students as well. Because part of social emotional learning is also uh, how to make wise decisions. <laughs> um, so that was actually my question. I was just thinking it would be awesome if we could develop apps and things like that that can actually um, assist with the academic support that we provide for students. Um, and then um, I just wanted to also say uh, that I think um, with, mo with mobile devices, and I mean our students at the moment use mobile devices to write exams and everything like that, so I'm really excited about the different options that you presented, so thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, absolutely. Um, academic and emotional support. I just want to highlight one example. Um, as, as most of you know, like uh, mobile messaging is uh, one of the, if not the most popular uh, service on mobile devices. So what we do on that and also did on that uh, we started the project also beginning this year on uh, developing so-called um, intelligent conversational agents. Um, you can also call them chatbots. That depends on your interpretation and on, on how much intelligence or artificial intelligence you put in there. But especially for uh, training or, or supporting students in, and educators in online study skills, as goal setting, as monitoring of their goals, as motivational issues. Uh, basically, our hope, and this is in the experimentational phase, but there's also some evidence that we um, can support students via these chatbots directly in their daily uh, struggle, we have to say nowadays, uh, to continue their study successfully. And uh, we're pretty optimistic on that part. And there is evidence so well for emotional support as also uh, metacognitive support for students um, uh, working with um, conversational interfaces and agents. I hope that answers a bit of your question, but that is one approach we're taking currently. Thanks, Marcus. I see why the, the colleagues are getting ready for further questions. Uh, Anna Marie, Bates posed a good question. Uh, in at UNISA, we are now moving uh, away from our traditional learning management system, uh, which is Sakai based, to a Moodle based platform. Uh, and she posed the question of whether she hopes that the new platform will make provision for this type of augmented reality approaches. But just a quick one to follow up on that, Marcus. Uh, what is there a specific learning management platform that you all are using in the institution? <laughs> A uh, very good question. Um, as I'm working with uh, uh, three universities, we basically have two bigger learning management systems in place. Uh, one is Brightspace, the other one is Canvas. Uh, both have their facilities but they are, and, and, and possibilities and strengths and weaknesses. Um, I cannot tell you which is the, the, the better or, or worse one of these. Um, what we basically mostly do there is to um, either develop specific plugins or components we you can embed in this backbone. Uh, because of, of course, one issue uh, you always run into, even if all the services are available, you need to, of course, uh, develop a, a safe haven in, in that sense and also uh, um, because, of, of course, GDPR is important, uh, for, very important for us. Uh, keeping the student data safe is important for us. Um, and then also using services 
uh, that are uh, secured uh, only to be accessed by by uh, personal staff and students. Uh, this is very important to us. So, of course, you need this backbone and integration with this backbone to ensure uh, this uh, proper uh, properly. Um, yeah, these are the two platforms we we, we use in, in in daily life, and we uh, think they offer a lot of uh, possibilities for extensions. Thank, thanks, Marcus. I think that's a good point. Is that uh, and also the idea of using uh, exploring both Canvas and the in the um, bright side. Uh, we've got two questions. Uh, let me open up the floor first for Lydia. Hi, Marcus. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my, my question regards the algorithms that work behind the, um, for example, body language, how, how um, inclusive those algorithms are across diverse cultural um, settings, and how do you achieve that inclu inclusivity? Thank yes. You. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Uh, basically, how we achieve that uh, is that it's a, a, a rule-based system and it's not a, a data-driven system in first instance. So how did we come to uh, the kind of rule set that governs or that, that we use to construct the feedback algorithm for the presentation trainer? That is based on interviews uh, we did with uh, coaches. Uh, that train, uh, give presentation trainings. And out of that, we constructed different, uh, different go do's, no, don't, uh, do's and don'ts for different phases of a presentation, these kind of issues. And uh, the, okay, you might say that there are, um, there could be some biases, but we didn't have any of that. We used it for, um, people uh, different age, different body sizes, different body shapes, uh, also with different voice pitches. Um, so it's basically a rule-based system. It's not an only data-driven approach where you get the typical biases based on the data set you use to train your uh, neural network, but we built on the core of uh, a rule-based approach and um, I hope that answers the, the, the question. But it, of course, if we roll it out in, in really different settings, we would uh, need to check that again. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, OK, we've got one question here by Professor Vanessa Stienkamp. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Marcus. Very uh, fantastic talk, nice technology. I'm, I am from the University of Pretoria, the Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning in the faculty, and actually we're looking at um, clinical training alternatives, and this is something that really could offer this. I would like to ask, and I'm sorry if I missed it, I had a bit of difficulties, technical difficulties during when the questions and answers started, so I had to re-log on. The, the cost implications, you said it was easy, um, you know, it's not really rocket science to have it, not fancy advanced, um, and you can use your mobile device. However, there must be costs um, involved in this whole thing. What are we looking at at the costs to get this set up and to get this done, um, to the, this augmented reality? And then also, um, how data intensive is are these? Um, uh, uh, programs. That's another thing that is of concern. It's actually in where people are resource strapped um, that we need to, to know that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the interesting question. I would like to give you two uh, a two split uh, answer uh, that also goes more on a on a low fi and a high fi uh, possibility of of, of uh, embedding augmented reality. So the low fi uh, version is that uh, we had um, a lecturer. Uh, we have so so called uh, teaching fellows uh, at the, at our uh, universities and they basically apply for a two year grant to spend one day of their week on research on uh, innovative uh, technologies they want to use in their courses and that could help other lecturers also to and to develop their course, courses further 
So we had had one uh, colleague, Martin Stellingwerf, uh, working on augmented reality. He came from an architecture and industrial design background, and he developed um, only uh, existing mobile and uh, applications for uh, developing uh, augmented reality content. So there is a very low fi and low um, access uh, solution which uses existing applications. You just have, we're talking about licensing costs probably for software for one workplace of something between uh, extensive apps from uh, or really, really uh, powerful apps for 10 uh, euros up to probably a workplace uh, or workbench solution for of 50 or 100 euros. So little costs for with which you can develop augmented reality content. And the advantage is that uh, most modern mobile devices, let's say you need to, uh, there are different platforms for, for that, but most are existing in the hands of, of uh, people, I would say, as soon as they have a camera and do the embedding. This is um, the, the lo-fi realization, which uh, requires uh, very little invest investment. And then the top of the notch development, we're now you're looking into with 4D, 4D volumetric capturing, basically uh, needs uh, a full recording set. So you need to set up a stage uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, space sensors and cameras, uh, which we're now looking at at costs of um, 100 to up to 300,000 euros for a recording studio in which you can record multiple person interactions into volumetric data. And then, of course, also on the on the replay side, uh, you can go from a student, uh, let's say uh, augmented reality HoloLens, uh, then you are at 3000 euros or 2000 euros for a workplace uh, at home to or to replay um, the augmented reality content. And of course, also for public spaces, uh, these things are still quite expensive. So I, I would say we, we talk about a range from where you could have really 100 euros for a content creation place to replaying on existing smartphones and mobile devices up to a range for having a full TV recording studio for volumetric data and having uh, a real good um, replay experience. That is the I hope that uh, that helps. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Thank I think you that, very that's much. That was very useful. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I think uh, that was an important question that was raised, Marcus, because uh, it's a matter of us advancing towards technology, but also being cognizant of the cost towards our institution and the ICT infrastructure that we need in place. But I like the fact that we could vary these costs, so it allows us that flexibility to develop and advance with these with these types of trends as well. Uh, Marcus, I think we'll take this last question that's on the on the chat by Tabita and uh, you know one of the issues in the South African context is the idea of Africanization, decolonization, Africanization and the shift towards uh, bringing in multi-languages. Uh, so in terms of uh, multilingual, these mobile platforms, capability of it, have you all used anything of that sort? Yeah, um, help me a bit with that question. So multilingual uh, content or, or uh, delivery in, 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 in different languages, is that correct? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Now, yeah, um, I, I cannot. I, I, I mean, I can only uh, say something uh, in in the context of uh, translation and natural language processing um, of um, uh, mostly European languages. Uh, but there, I can tell you, I was myself uh, really surprised by the level. Of course, we now get uh, language recognition and speech to text recognition and translation from uh, natural language processing engines. So just to give you a, a little example, I recently produced a MOOC for research methods um, for the extension school in Delft. Um, uh, and uh, I did all my um, 
I just recorded my videos and within minutes I had a complete transcript into English and a complete translation into two other languages. Uh, and I had to correct, I would say, only two to five percent maximum of the text that came out of these engines. So I think uh, with that level of quality, you get very little additional effort you need to bring video or other con uh, content into other languages and make it more accessible. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I think you answered that question quite well. Uh, thank you very, very much, Marcus. I think this was a fascinating session. As, a, as always, you never fail to impress us with, uh, with the amount of knowledge you got, but also uh, the way you plot technology uh, in terms of benchmarking internationally. Okay, thank you very much for, for having me and um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think you got cut off a bit. So thanks Marcus once again for uh, this innovative uh, session, uh, but more specifically uh, your ability to plot us and give us some direction in the developing context as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, yeah, you, you've, you've plotted it quite well, but also you've given us opportunities for us to think uh, amidst our cost in South Africa, amidst our ICT infrastructure, how we can still advance and make uh, higher education innovative in terms of meeting the demands of our students. Uh, I think uh, Prince Carol Ka Prince's last comment on the chat uh, is quite interesting, is that uh, our students, our, our, our students are at a young age where they are all mobile Basically, everybody has access to mobile. And, you know, we always say that some of these students have more fancier mobile devices than some of our academics. <laughs> so the potential to do this kind of stuff is really, really there. Uh, but I also think it's a matter of, of now the willpower of ICT together uh, with our, of our institutions uh, to realign our, our strategies in teaching and learning, uh, as well as our government to start funding institutions to advance this type of uh, developments. Uh, because if we want to make ourselves, and COVID-19, uh, the crisis of COVID-19 has shown us that if we do not start investing in ICT infrastructure, the gaps are going to grow much, much more wider for us. Uh, so this is actually quite excellent. So thank you very, very much, Marcus, uh, for this and for opening up the session for us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to more future collaborations with you. And I know that this is the start of a great change. So thank you, Marcus. Unfortunately, we kind of applaud. Everybody kind of applaud, but I guarantee you from everybody's side. Thank you very, very much, Marcus, and uh, we'll chat soon.